yes, uh, we, it's the, the, the turn of Juan Pablo Martin. <laughs> Juan Pablo is a PhD student at the Spanish Institute of Oceanography and the uh, University of La Laguna. He graduated in environmental science and holds a master's degree in assessment and environmental monitoring of marine ecosystems. He's interested in the effect of physical chemical per perturbation in, on the ocean and currently is studying the submarine hydrothermalism in Taboro as an environmental stressor. Uh, this is the Thank you, Anna. Um, well, um, I'm going to talk about Taboro as well, but from another point of view. And I also uh, bring my my toy <laughs> that's an important part of my my study um yeah but uh, I will focus mainly in the characterization of the, um, the spatial distribution and and also I'm gonna characterize the hydrothermal fluxes so as a general idea, I just want to show you the uh, global distribution of all the hydrothermal vents that are reported to Interreach. Interreach is an international database created uh, 22 years ago, and the first edition was about 200 uh, sites, and the current version, that is the number 3.4, uh, was released two years ago and um, yeah the number has increased um, up to 721 um, all of them or most of them are uh, distributed along the um, uh, central uh, spreading centers and um, in the mid ocean spreading centers are volcanoes areas and um, most of them as well are at deep sea, but not all of them. Um, we have also shallow submarine volcanoes. Um, can you guess how many? Or you can think of how many? So we have only 64 shallow submarine volcanoes that they are distributed in the first 200 meters uh, below the sea level. And, um, of course, Tagoro is one of them. But Tagoro is not only a shallow submarine volcano, it's also an intraplate submarine volcano, which means that it's not in the border of the tectonic plates, but far away. And it's a, an isolated um, submarine. And um, if we consider this characteristic, that is a submarine volcano and an interplate uh, submarine volcano, we only have three registered in this uh, interreach database. And despite there are only three of them, they are not completely characterized. I mean, we don't know the real extension of the total hydrothermal active area of each of them. We don't know the real hydrothermal fluxes. For example, uh, here we have a McDonald's Simon, and we only know there is 150 meters below the sea level, and there is emitted hydrothermal fluxes um, detected mm, through the plum detection. Um, that's why it's very important this work because we are going to characterize one of them. There is a tower here. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, and then we have also Espalamaca here that we only know that uh, its hydrothermal field uh, occupy a um, decent of tens meters. Um, and again, a global image of the heat fluxes. Uh, uh, this authors here, Davis and Davis, estimated that 25% of the global heat comes from hydrothermal flows. And, and then 
in this paper and they say that 60% of these flux comes from off axis. So again, this is a, um, a general view of the distribution of the heat, but that's a, a global model. But we don't have enough um, studies uh, ongoing uh, at field scale. That's why this um, work in Tagoro is going to be very important to increase the knowledge of uh, at um, vent um, scale because we are going to know, we are going to determine the, the hydrothermal uh, area and also the hydrothermal fluxes and heat flux. To do that, uh, we are going to use a bunch of different instruments, uh, data, for example, we are going to use georeferenced video image collected um, with our ROV here, and also oceanographic data. Um, during the oceanographic process using the CTD and also a CTD mounted in the ROV, um, pH meter and temperature probes that they are fixed on the um, subfloor to measure the um, temperature anomaly of the fluid. And also we are going to use this particle tracker device that this instrument here to measure um, the, the fluids the, the, the fluids directly from the from the vents. Okay, so uh, let's start um, for the hydrothermal distribution. So the first transect that we have we see here was uh, deployed in 2014 and it covers the secondary cones here and this flank. And the next uh, campaigns, we focus on the main crater and the summit here. In total, uh, there were 44 um, transects and we collected around 100 hours of video imagery. Um, and of course, I examined all of them and we obtain this map over here where we see all the different transects and this, the black dots um, mainly located in the crater and in the summit here. So uh, in this map we also observe that uh, the, the area covered by the rope is a bit larger than the active area. So we can say that or we can assume that the active area is quite good and um, quite well defined. Here we have the same map with the limits of the crater, the summit and the limits of the active area. That uh, it's um, around 6,700 square meter and we were able to identify three, more than 3,000 individual vents with a, a high variability of morphologies, as we can see here, that orifices between rocks. And this image is from the summit where we see some algae between the vents, chimney-like vents over here, and also a, a high um, extension of diffuse uh, venting. We also study the temperature anomalies. And, and for that, we use these uh, probes here that uh, where we fix a, a hobos in the extreme and we fix it on the, in the, um, the subfloor around 20 centimeters below in order to uh, measure the temperature of the fluid um, before it uh, dissipated. And uh, we deployed a total of four, more than 40 different stations in the active area and also two long um, terms um, station for more than 30 minutes and, and also this one over here it was more than 10 hours measuring the temperature and of course we also need uh, reference stations that were um, taken uh, far away from the influence of the volcano 
and uh, in the same years as the um, this experiment and and also we estimated the the um, the temperature for the same depth as the um, the 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 station in Tagoro and as a result we obtain a a temperature of reference of about 18 19 celsius degrees and a temperature of the fluid of about 32 celsius degrees and that's the temperature anomaly and if you remember the Eugenio's talk he said that during the eruption uh, they detected 18 uh, celsius uh, an anomaly of 13 celsius degree so it's still very very warm <laughs> And now, uh, with this instrument um, that was uh, designed by our team, uh, following the specification of Saracin, um, was used to measure directly from the vents the, the, the flow velocity. And it is composed of a very big chamber where a narrower uh, and graduated and transparent uh, pipe was installed and also it has a handle here to be manipulated by our ROV. Um, it has a skirt uh, to seal to the bottom and avoid the, the leakage and also the, the treatment. And um, you can see here a panel there is a kind of grid um, that was also installed. Uh, probably you can see that later. Um, that was also installed to uh, avoid a turbulent fluid. So each station um, was deployed for around ten minutes, and the um, and, and the way that we use it was in um, first place we try to detect the anomalies uh, with this pH meter. And then we place it on the floor. We make sure that it was completely sealed to the, to the bottom. And then we see the, the flow going out. Um, and in order to measure the, the velocity at the substratum level, we just counted the, the distance of the particles ascending and in the determined uh, time. And then we divide it uh, between a, a ratio of the, uh, the surface of the chamber and the pipe in order to obtain the, the velocity at the substratum level because we are not very interested in the velocity here because it's going to be um, very different to the real one because of the difference of diameters. And it was deployed into different campaigns around the active area. As a result, uh, we obtained the flow velocity and also, because we know the, the area, we also calculated the flow rate. And as uh, an average, we obtained a five 0.5 centimeters per minute and a flow rate of 55 liters per minute and a square meter. And as we know the whole active area, we can estimate the global uh, rate of the total active area of Tagoro. That is more than 350,000 liters per minute. And probably you won't know what what is this magnitude but if i tell you that um, it's the equivalent to equivalent to fill a olympic swimming pool in around seven minutes you can have an idea and then um we have different uh, variability of, of speeds or velocity and we think that it's um this variability depending uh, it's going to be uh, because of the difference of the substrate, where we see some chimney fields over here, it's very rocky, individual 
uh, chimneys and also diffuse uh, venting areas and, and that's why we think that the, the flow rate uh, is different but again that's a work that is ongoing and we need more, more research. And then we have all these um, variables already, the area, the temperature anomaly, the um, velocity of the substrate at the substrate level and with that we already can calculate the heat fluxes. Um, in the yellow column we calculate it with the uh, average of the anomaly and then uh, the anomaly of the temperature then with the minimum and with the maximum. Um, for the total active area we estimated uh, 340 um, um, megawatts uh, and again probably you won't know what is this number but uh, that's the equivalent to 15 years of the electricity demand of the total population of El Hierro. So that's a very um, huge number. And to sum up, uh, we can say that we use this visual data to define the spatial distribution and we also estimated the real temperature of the fluid and we obtained the, the hydrothermal fluxes from the whole total area. Um, that's not all. We want all uh, as well to estimate the nutrient fluxes directly measured from the vents, and we want to monitor monitor the hydrothermal fluxes for a very longer period, probably installing a chamber for a week or something like that. Um, that's all. Thank you. So now, now is, uh, well, uh, Juan Pablo, thank you for your presentation. Very interesting, very uh, challenging results. <laughs> uh, this time for, for questions. Anyone here in the, in the room wants to, to make a question? Um, you said that, well, first of all, I think this is really interesting because it's the first time that it's like um, being monitorized and, and assessed, so congrats um, and keep, do keep um, going on. So I've seen that you said that there's a lot of flux variability because of the different location or material of the where, where the vents are located, but I didn't quite catch um, if there's actually different fluxes in the same hydrothermal um, vent. Well, it's, uh, thanks for the, the question. It's not uh, the same vent, but this, the, the, the total area. I mean, we are going to set a station here. Uh, probably this station is going to be um, over a diffuse venting area we, where we don't see the the bent fluid, but probably the next one, the next one, and um, the next station is gonna be settled in in a chimney vent where it is completely different to the previous one. So that's why we try to uh, characterize the total um, area because the substrate is completely different depending on the the area. Okay, so. You are not assessing how it's changing amount during time, okay? No, that's uh, the next step because uh, for the next campaign, hopefully, we can develop a chamber that we can leave there for a week and we can monitor this uh, specific area for a week or something, yeah, for a long period of time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wants to? Oh yeah, okay. Sorry, Juan, but it's just a, a comment from Juan Tomas saying just to congratulate you because he finds it very interesting, your, your job and, and your talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. No more questions?
But I'm curious about the, you know, the your your what is inside? device. Uh, yes. <laughs> And also, how how you manage to with the with the rock to, yeah, I mean, to I, take yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's super funny because this is super heavy, but when it's uh, at the bottom, it's too light. <laughs> yeah, when when it's under the sea water, uh, it cannot. It's not very heavy. So. So there is a this <laughs> this grid here. <laughs> it's, yeah. So there is this grid here. There is the honeycomb, and yeah, the function is to stabilize the the fluid, to avoid the turbulence, and also to have a a constant uh, fluid to the to the measuring part of the instrument. Because we don't want to measure the pulses. Thank you, Juan. Uh, I have to say that uh, Juan Pablo is a really talented uh, guy. He's really enthusiastic and he has already done everything by himself. So this is a really important thing that he's not only doing the science, but he's also collaborated with the designer of the instrument to do in the, in the campaign. And this is a really extra job. So congratulations for your talk also, Juan Pablo, and for yeah. the job that you are doing and you have already done a great job. So, okay. Okay. Just, just, just. <laughs> okay. Uh, how did you how do you manage not to tap the the, the, the exit of, of the gases? I mean for how long is it's the maximum uh, time that you can have it on the ocean floor? Uh, okay, this is manipulated by our our RB. So it's gonna be placed on the bottom. The time that we want, mm. but, but we assume that as you have the the flux, we also have sediments in that. So uh, sometimes, some moment you will have uh, you probably you have a problem of saturation of um, well, or, or change in the in the flux emission. I mean, the, the, it will be different uh, quantity, different volume of of uh, of gas that will. Uh, or, or, or flux that will pass because of the sediment. And yeah, uh, we are measuring uh, water, not gases. Okay, so yeah, that's super interesting because, uh, as I said, uh, all the station was uh, were deployed for ten minutes. So that um, we are not uh, studying the fluctuations of the different pulses, but that's also an objective to see if the, there is any variation along the day or during the weeks or the month. Sorry, I, I asked that because as you extrapolated the, the, the whole energy, about the, the energy that the island would need for the next uh, X, uh, uh, years, so uh, I thought that uh, maybe the next step should be to have it a, a larger uh, time frame in the bottom uh, because ob obviously uh, it's not uh, represented because of this short uh, sampling uh, time. I mean, uh, this sampling time is maybe the first peak of, of the energy that you'll have. But then as, as time goes by, probably you have uh, lower, uh, lower emissions. Yeah, that's right. That's why uh, we are deploying 14 different stations along the total active area just to try to minimize all these variations. But, but again, yes, uh, that would be perfect if we are able to deploy this instrument for a week, just to, to see if there are any variation and also to quantify this variation. So let's think if there's no more questions. Let's thank uh, Juan Pablo for uh, for his talk. <laughs> thank you.